Day one, the government research vessel Tongaroa embarks from Wellington, New Zealand on a precarious 50-day, $6 million mission. Destination, Antarctica. A voyage of potential discovery and definite danger. Just getting to the Ross Sea will tax the ship and crew. Navigating the mighty Southern Ocean and 460 kilometers of crushing sea ice. In this international polar year, Tangaroa will join 17 other ships in a top to bottom census of Antarctic marine life. And Andrew Leachman is its captain. The telephone directory of everything that's down there, because it's never really been done. But satellite charts show the worst icing condition in years. Even with Tangaroa's 70 meter long reinforced hull, this could be a mission impossible. Though he can hardly wait to get his hands on the strange scaly creatures from the sea floor, marine biologist Andrew Stewart knows it'll be no dip in the ocean. The ocean is a very difficult environment to study. Down here in the Southern Ocean, everything is that much harder. You've got to kit up like the Michelin man to get out on deck. Everything takes so much more effort. Whatever happens, the 44 scientists and crew know they'd better play well together because there's no turning back. They certainly won't like toys. The team has new gadgets, new cameras, cutting edge science to help them check the health of the ocean. Has overfishing caused harm? Is global warming forcing a sea change? The scientists aim to find out. Once they get past the seasickness. Ship's doctor, Jenny Visser, takes her job very seriously. Tangaroa will sail well beyond the reach of a helicopter rescue. If illness or injury strikes, help will come by slow boat or not at all. Dr. Jenny's skills could mean the difference between life and death. Right, how are we doing? Good, Yeah. Six days out, the team spots its first iceberg. See that? It's on the radar. That's good, that's good. A free-floating chunk of ice calved off an ice shelf. This legendary menace of the high seas reveals only one-eighth of itself as it glides aimlessly and destructively through the water. The team find it thrilling, an ominous hint of the hazards that lie ahead. Tungaroa is a fisheries research vessel, no icebreaker. And these small icebergs, called growlers, seem to be ganging up on the ship. Obviously, we're, um, there's icebergs around. It's bergy water. There's a few growlers about. We're heading south, so I'm not certain exactly where I'm going to go. I want to go and have a look and just have a feel for the terrain and so which way we can work our way through the ice to the Ross Sea. Captain Leachman navigates these waters, knowing others have attempted and failed. You're in the footsteps of Scott and Shackleton. It's a challenge. It's a real challenging thing for any ship's captain to take a ship down there. In 1914, Sir Ernest Shackleton's ship, Endurance, became trapped in sea ice. He and his crew spent a grueling winter battling the elements until the ice ultimately crushed and sunk the ship. It's an epic tale of Antarctic survival. And it replayed in 2007 when ice engulfed the tour ship Explorer in Antarctic waters. Read the history and you'll know I am very careful because I know the rules. The rules are simple. Never underestimate the ice and never turn your back on it. Satellite ice charts and reports from other ships will help guide him to the thinnest parts of the pack ice. 
head scientist Stu Hanchett worries about the encroaching ice barrier scuttling their plans, but he trusts the captain. There was quite a bit of a concern whether we would in fact be able to get into the Ross Sea and achieve some of our objectives. We envisage probably taking two, maybe three days to, to break through the pack ice in, into the open waters of, of the Ross Sea itself. The Tongaroa may not be an icebreaker, but the ice doesn't know it. The sharp prow makes short work of it, for now. Off the stern, the minky whale finds sanctuary, scarfing down a hearty meal of krill among the ice chunks. Minkies can grow nearly nine meters, positively puny compared to their blue whale cousins, who can stretch to more than three times that size. And that means an awful lot of krill to sustain a healthy population of whales, penguins, and seals. Especially the crab eater seals, who also make their home on the shifting ice, slurping down krill, not crabs. Each year, they eat about 25 times their body weight in krill, filtered through their interlocking, strainer-like teeth. And these ever-popular emperors of Antarctica will pass the dark and brutal winter by mating. They'll brave temperatures lower than minus 40 to lay eggs and raise their chicks. The work these scientists do down here could help all these animals survive an uncertain future. Each night, three hours of darkness brings new danger to the ice-clogged waters. Safety depends on constant vigilance. This is only summer ice. In the winter, Tungaroa wouldn't stand a chance. Right, how we doing? Let's look. At last, the ship breaks free. By now, Tongaroa has spent 10 days at sea, nearly four of them packed in ice. Wind and currents keep this part of the Ross Sea ice-free in summer. Voyage leader John Mitchell can breathe a little easier, but experience tells him he hasn't seen the last of it. It's always going to get in the way, regardless what you do. Even on the best ice years, you still get ice. And it's, still, it's, it's always where you want to be. While the sea stays calm and free of ice, the team prepares to plunge into an alien world. For the first time, these scientists will get to see what's down there, courtesy of the deep-toed imaging system they call DITIS, custom-made for this type of deep-sea exploration. Its high-definition video and stills cameras will act as the team's eyes in this high-pressure, low-light environment. Okay, we're ready to go. And we're in position. Go in ready. No one has actually field-tested the unit in such icy conditions before. Too late to think about that now. Like an explorer dispatched to a foreign world, the imaging system begins its fact-finding mission. The scientists hold their breath. Uh, yeah, this is the dry lab we're on channel 15, mate. Roger that, thank you. Nobody really knows what's down here. At last, the ocean floor. Andrew, could you just uh, hold there for a moment, please? We're recording now. To a marine biologist, mm -hmm. this is big, like the first moonwalk. As the live video images come up from the seabed, the scientists log what they see and strain to find things they've never seen before. They will 
crawl for an hour, the length of a videotape, giving the team their first tantalizing image of polar marine life in perpetual nighttime. There's quite a lot of fragments of things here, isn't there? Now that they've seen the creatures on the video, they want to get their hands on them. For that, they'll need to trawl with nets, not cameras. They approach trawling systematically. First, they'll trawl the bottom of the ocean, sweeping across the floor to sample the bottom dwellers. Then they'll trawl at mid-level, collecting samples of free-swimming fish, then skimming the surface for plankton. They'll also use specialized equipment to sample water and mud from directly beneath the ship to study its microbes and chemical makeup. As a commercial fishing practice, bottom trawling dredges up worldwide controversy because of damage to the seabed. Science, however, takes a gentler approach. You know, we, we have limited our trawls uh, to, to about 15 or 20 minutes bottom time. The actual percentage of the total seabed area impacted by the bottom trawl is, is very small. It's chilly cold. But the bottom trawl doesn't even last 15 minutes before the rough seabed forces the crew to pull the net. That's the cue for American marine biologist Christopher Jones to grab his gear. This will be exciting. The anticipation makes the scientists forget all about the minus 10 degrees Celsius conditions. And Andrew Stewart thinks all of his Christmases have come at once. It's gonna be a bit like Santa Claus coming up the stern ramp there. We don't know what's gonna be in that sack. Um, could be a pair of socks or it could be a, a new bike, who knows. Now this is good, we've got all sorts of things in here. Santa must be pleased with Christopher Jones. There's a big Desosticus, a big beautiful Desosticus moss and I. That's what we're looking for, we got a good one here. Desosticus moss and I, the Antarctic toothfish, one of the giants of the marine ecosystem. On the menu, it goes by Chilean sea bass and it's harvested by the thousands. If it disappears from the ocean, more than dinner's at stake. A nice diverse catch here. It could mean an ecosystem on the brink of collapse. This is the fish that is probably the most economically important uh, species that's being caught by the commercial fishery in the Southern Ocean. This is a fine specimen here of, a, of an Antarctic toothfish. This big guy tells the crew that all's well down below. The undersea camera built up the team's expectations about what they might collect. Yes. And the bottom trawl net delivers on its promise. Sponges, among the most primitive sea animals, have no nervous or digestive systems. They feed by filtering water through their pores. The trawl brought up an exotic specimen that weaves its body out of silica. That's a hexactinellid sponge which is also known as a glass sponge, and a very slow growing, very irritating if you get any of the spicules on you. And Santa's sack has delivered a special gift for Andrew. Snailfish, fantastic. Snailfish are poorly understood, and Andrew may have found a new species. Some of these beauties down to the lab. It's beautiful. This is why I came to Antarctica. <laughs> Seeing things like this, it's just beyond words. We now have whole families of fishes that are found nowhere else in the world, except in the Southern Ocean. And these are fascinating animals. These are the ice fishes. Temperatures above five degrees Celsius are too hot for them, and in fact, are lethal for them. The sea holds a dizzying variety of fish to baffle and thrill marine biologists. Nature even saw fit to make about 115 species of Andrew snailfish. Uh, you have to look at such features as the shape of the teeth, the jaws, the shape of the gill rakers, as well as counts of the vertebrae, counts of the dorsal and anal fin rays. And then 
along comes the kind of discovery that blows biologists out of the water. Now I have no idea which species this is at the moment. That color pattern on the fins is like nothing I've ever seen before. Most scientists hope to find something truly new, but only a few actually accomplish it. Andrew might have discovered yet another new species, making him the first human to lay eyes on this creature that's evolved over millions of years. Though cut short, this first trawl offers something for everyone. Oh, I'm very happy with the first trawl. Yeah, we only had um, 10 minutes on the bottom. Uh, and the, it was some quite rough ground, so we had to haul, haul early, but um, yeah, it looks, looks very good for the first one. Scientists have catalogued about 135 species of fish from the largely unexplored Ross Sea. On this expedition, the team intends to add a new chapter to this Antarctic fish story. In the depths of the ship, the team studies the fish finder to locate schools of small fish and krill, the foundation of the elaborate food chain. Since big fish depend on little fish, the scientists want to check their health. That means another fishing expedition. Yeah, hi Andrew, it's Richard here down in the acoustics lab. Uh, we're seeing a bit of a mark on our standard down here. We're quite interested in doing a, a mid-water trawl. The target's spotted. The net's deployed. But as the net closes in on the fish, the weather closes in on the ship. Unlike the previous trawl, this monster mid-water net will trawl between surface and the sea bottom, scooping up the free-swimming fish. This is the bit that's going into the trawl, and all these little red tick marks through here, um, that tells us we're catching fish. So everything's looking good, isn't it, Andrew? It is indeed. Menacing clouds gather on the horizon. A sudden turn into polar weather can endanger equipment and anyone caught on deck. Okay. We'll hold it down. All righty. Coming up. There she comes. The wind from the approaching front hits suddenly. Before they can get the net on board, a full gale sends its fury. Oh, and now. Oh, and now. Crashing over the stern can easily sweep a crew member into the icy, churning sea, where the cold shot can kill in three minutes. But the crew won't abandon the catch. The net overflows with silverfish, a very healthy sign. It's um, one of the most abundant species in the Ross Sea. It's eaten by quite a lot of species, so it's important in the food chain. Among the mass of silverfish, Andrew spies a lethal predator most likely feeding when snared. What's the name of that again, Andrew? Dagatooth. A dagatooth. Wonder what it was called that. Stick your finger in his mouth. Just. This striking find wields a mean it's set of chompers. It's pretty fish. Comes up underneath like that, bites down, chomps, reverses, Severs the spinal cord. It's paralyzing that fish and turns around. The ferocious storm puts a halt to the science program. The ship slows down to ride it out. Nature runs the show now, and the team battens down the hatches. This isn't fun, you know. Despite the boats pitching and rolling, life goes on. A well-stocked galley serves those who could still manage to keep the food down. Whatever the sea throws at them, the team takes in stride. 
Though striding in heavy swell does take some practice. The storm passes, costing the crew a day and a half's sampling. <laughs> Microbiologist Julie Hall's work involves checking the health of the Southern Ocean's tiniest residents. This device collects her water samples. She can remotely open and close the sampling bottles at various depths from the seabed to the surface. Okay, we're ready to go, Steve's ready. Once the samples break the surface, the team rushes to retrieve them without spilling a drop. As you can see, it's a difficult and dangerous operation, and the get crew have to be really careful bringing it on board in such rough and slippery conditions. So we're going to pull it round into the garage so that we're out of the wind with the sampling and then we'll start taking the samples off the bottles. She wants to see if increased greenhouse gases in the ocean have any effect on life down here. She'll measure chemicals, water temperature and bacteria in the sea. We've got the water from that coming out and going in about 10 different directions for analysis of nutrients in the water, chlorophyll, phytoplankton. We're also looking at viruses, the microzooplankton, those very, very tiny zooplankton. Her work in this far off sea may have global implications, but Julie's about to feel the full weight of her isolation from the world back home. Just two weeks into the mission, Captain Leachman receives an urgent satellite phone call from the New Zealand police. Early morning, um, I was called to the bridge. And the, the sergeant in Matamata said, look, we've got some bad news here. Have you got a, a Dr. Julie Hall aboard? And I said, yes. And he said, well, unfortunately, her husband's been killed in a gliding accident. Anyway, what I, what I did do is um, got Julie up and sat her down. It was my duty to inform her. And, and it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I'm awfully sorry. Um, I've got some bad news and your husband's been killed. Julie's husband, Dr. Trevor Adkins, was also a scientist. He died while competing in a gliding competition. He was competing in the New Zealand Championships and uh, he'd had an accident very close to the airfield and had been killed instantly on impact um, at the site. I explained that I would do everything in my power to get her home. But the difficulty, of course, of being in isolating, isolated where we were, there's no guarantee we could get her off. Fickle weather and enormous distances have conspired against Julie. By now, Tongaroa has sailed well beyond reach of any helicopter and too far out to turn around. If Julie has any hope of getting home, Captain Leachman must find a nearby ship able to make the journey. <laughs> 